Welcome to today's live stream Lunch and Learn. My name is Charlie Schwartz, the Director of Digital Engagement and Learning here at the Jewish Theological Seminary. It's a really beautiful day here at JTS. The, the courtyard is all ready for, for commencement, and we're in the middle of finals period, so there's kind of a, a hushed tone throughout the halls as all the students are in the library studying away for their finals, which makes it a fantastic time to have this Lunch and Learn in Solomon's Temple, the wisdom and vitality of Solomon Schechter with Chancellor Arnold Eisen, the Chancellor of, of JTS. There are a few ways that you can participate in today's live stream Lunch and Learn. Uh, first, by watching. Second, if you have a question or comments about what we are talking about, you can chat them in on the chat box to the side of the, of the screen on learn.jtsa.edu backslash live. You can participate via Facebook on JTS's Facebook page or via Twitter by including the hashtag JTS Live. Uh, with that, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce my teacher, Chancellor Arnold Eisen. Thanks, Charlie. What I thought I would do today is not give an academic lecture about Solomon Schechter, but following the title, talk about how Solomon Schechter has come to mean more to me in my almost six years now in Solomon's temple. JTS very much is the temple that Schechter built with his energy, with his vision, with his fundraising abilities, with his frustration, and we are the better for it. And I also see Schechter as having built a temple the same way Solomon did of old. That is, Schechter was a wise man. The more I read Schechter, and especially now that I read Schechter, not as I used to read Schechter, namely as a historian of modern Judaism, and particularly a historian of American Judaism, but as someone in an institutional role, appreciating from the inside the decisions that Schechter made, I really come to admire this man more than ever before, even I would say to feel very fond of him. And some days I actually love Solomon Schechter and I'm profoundly grateful for what he has done for us. Um, we, we did a sort of a comical Purimishpiel about me a couple years ago where no one at JTS wants to talk to me and I impulsively go to the portrait of Solomon Schechter in the hallway downstairs and start talking to Solomon Schechter. And what I was doing at that moment was only acting out what I often do. I often talk to Solomon Schechter. Um, because he really bequeathed to me uh, an enormous legacy, and I want to share some of that legacy with you. So the first talk that Schechter gave at JTS, his inaugural address, is reprinted in this volume. I have my edition that I got as a, as a prize for good work in high school, Hebrew high school. Uh, Salma Schechter's Seminary Addresses. I hope the book is still in print. Is this in print? Uh, do you know? I'm not sure. Well, let's, let's make sure it's in print. And there's an address called the Charter of the Seminary, which I used as the basis of my own talk, um, my own inaugural address at JTS um, in the fall of 2006, my opening assembly address. And Schechter does a number of things in that address that I wanted to share with you. And then I'm going to go on and talk about two or three more addresses that Schechter gave or, or essays that Schechter wrote which I find especially crucial right now to me, and I think not just to me, but to us as well. So the first wonderful thing that Schechter does in this Charter of the Seminary, his inaugural address delivered in 1902, was that he says he wants to operate amidst a variety of different approaches to Judaism. Schechter never wanted there to be a JTS catechism. He did not select faculty on the basis of their agreement with some notion that he had of what Judaism is. And he, he said, in fact, explicitly, um, this school should never become partisan ground or a hotbed of polemics, making, and he quotes this from somewhere, I don't know the source, confusion worse confounded. The name of the Holy One, blessed be he, is peace, and the place erected to his name and to the cultivation of his Torah should, to use the figurative language of the rabbis, be the spot on the horizon where heaven and earth kiss each other. By which Schechter meant he wanted this concern for earthly things, scholarship, all the expertise that we could bring to, the, to our, our, our study of Judaism, but he also wanted us never to forget the role that this has in furthering the aims of Judaism and of the Holy One. And he did not want, for the life of him, he did not want to found a party opinion here which JTS would represent. He says um, throughout um, the essay, more and more he wants variety at JTS. He says somewhere, I want some of my faculty to accuse me of being a raving mystic, while to other members of my faculty I would be too much of a skeptical rationalist. I want disagreement here 
all the time. Um, I do not want ignorance. The guideline of JTS is there shall not be ignorance. Our students here must know all there is to know of Judaism. And one of the keys I have to what Schechter meant by the Jewish Theological Seminary is this paragraph, it's on page 19 of, of the essay. Schechter said, actually Franz Rosenzweig would use this ver was to use this very same language about 20 years afterwards, I wanted every student at JTS to, to say the following, quote, I regard nothing Jewish as foreign to me. The JTS student should know everything Jewish, Bible, Talmud, Midrash, liturgy, Jewethes, Jewish ethics, Jewish philosophy, Jewish history, and Jewish mysticism, and even Jewish folklore. None of these subjects with its various ramifications should be entirely strange to him. Schechter wanted a wide-ranging knowledge on the part of his students. He set high standards for himself and for all of us who come after him. But the point was, again, that he didn't want agreement here on what Jewish is. He wanted the, the notion of Jewish to be as expansive as possible. And I would say, without a shadow of a doubt, that when Mordechai Kaplan said that Judaism should be understood as civilization and not just as religion, he was correct in believing that in this he expressed the will of his teacher, Solomon Schechter. There's also a passage I very much admire uh, and repeated in my own opening assembly address, where he said, I once heard a friend of mine exclaim angrily to a pupil, Sir, how dare you always agree with me? I do not even profess to agree with myself always. Again, he didn't want to train a body of students who are spouting some party line. He wanted vigorous debate at his JTS. And one of the greatest gifts that Solomon Schechter has given to me personally and to all of us at JTS is this openness, this welcoming of diversity, this, I would even call it a pluralism. Like all pluralisms, there's a range. It's not that anything goes, but there's a wide range of what is not only acceptable but desirable. And that Schechter should say to a student, how dare you always agree with me? I do not always agree with myself. That resonates with me. I don't know that I'm always right. I want to be corrected by my colleagues and my students. I want vigorous disagreement. And that, to me, is a, is a model uh, of what Schechter hoped to um, to get from all of us. That's something really special. It's a lesson too often forgotten. So I actually think that this would be mistakenly called a big tent. This is not a big tent. Schechter wanted a temple here that's much more than a big tent because he's not saying everyone is welcome no matter where they stand, no matter what they practice, no matter what they agree upon. But Schechter is saying that they're, we're here united by something that he called Torah. We're here to serve Torah, and by serving Torah, to serve God. We're here to learn as much as we can by all these different areas. Someone who says that part of this learning is irrelevant is wrong. That person can have a place here. They can argue with us here, but the curriculum here is going to be broad. But we're united by the fact that we're here to serve God, and we're here to serve Torah. And so we're not merely inhabitants of one place, a tent or a temple, we're here to enrich each other with our conversation about Torah that comes from the sort of learning that Schechter described. And this brings me quite naturally to the other major address that to me is formative. Schechter gave a talk the next year, 1903, in April, um, delivered at a dedication of a seminary building called the Seminary as Witness. And you know, as usual in Schechter, there are quotations from a wide variety of Jewish and non-Jewish authors. This is part of what Schechter demanded from his students and from his faculty. You would read an essay by Schechter, and you would come across Ralph Waldo Emerson. You would come across an entire essay in this book on Abraham Lincoln, who was not only one of Schechter's heroes, but someone to whom Schechter looked for inspiration. You would find poetry, you'd find novelists, George Eliot is here, and you'd also find a wide range of Jewish sources quoted. And the first way in which the seminary is witness is the seminary is a witness because it engages in a kind of learning that values the range of people that Solomon Schechter is going to be quoting in his essays. In other words, Schechter was famous 
for saying that he wanted his rabbinical students to know how to speak English and, and, and play baseball. All right, that was a model for the Americanization of the rabbinate, which he wanted to accomplish. But this went much further. It went all the way down. That is, Schechter embraced this new country of his with gusto. Schechter wanted students who are fully a part of American culture in the deepest sense. And so when he's quoting in his addresses at JTS, George Eliot and Ralph Waldo Emerson and Abraham Lincoln, he's modeling for them a kind of learning. And then he goes on and quotes a wide variety of Jewish sources, whether it's Maimonides or the Baal Shem Tov for, or whatever, and he's modeling with that. That is part of what the seminary is witness to. The seminary is witness to a particular possibility of Jewish learning, a kind of Jewish leader that had yet to be created, which he wanted to be created, and a model of what he wanted American Jewish life to be, fully at home in the Ralph Waldo Emerson and George Eliot world and Abraham Lincoln, and fully at home in a wide variety of Jewish sources. Well, we come to the end of this essay, The Seminary as Witness, and we come to a page which for me is a crucial statement of what our kind of Judaism that became known as conservative Judaism should be. Schechter spends, oh, almost two pages of the essay on this. What is the seminary witnessing to? What kind of Judaism do we stand for? And he starts it off with the by the way statement. Almost, he just stipulates it as if there's no argument here. And this statement itself would be controversial in some Jewish quarters. He says, if I were asked what connection is there, say, in order to accept present company, that is, those who are gathered at JTS and the faculty and student body, what connection is there between Rabbi Moses ben Maimon of Cordova, known as Maimonides, and Solomon ben Isaac of Troy, known as Rashi? I would say, none save in God and his Torah. In other words, there's a lot of difference between Rambam and Rashi. And Schechter, rather than seeking to cover it up, now expands upon it for half a page. And I'm going to read you some of this just to give you the sense of how Schechter is not only owning up to, but glorying in, glorying in, rejoicing in some of the diversity that occurs inside mandatory, mainstream Jewish tradition. The one lived under a Mohammedan government, the other under a Christian government. The one spoke Arabic, the other French. The one had all the advantages of an Eastern civilization, the other lived in the barbaric West. I think Schechter says this with some irony, but he loved pointing out in Christian America in 1903 that if you're in the Middle Ages, you're not living in the high spot of world civilization. If you're in the Islamic Middle Ages, you are. The one was a merchant, afterwards a famous physician in the great capitals of Cordova and Cairo. The other was a rabbi without salary in an unimportant provincial city. The one was a persona grata for many years of his life at the court of Saladin, quote, the most enlightened despot who ever sat on a throne, end quote. The other probably never had the good or rather the bad fortune of ever speaking even to the chief constable of his place. The one was a thorough Aristotelian and possessed of all the culture of his day. The other was an exclusively rabbinic scholar and hardly knew the name of Aristotle. The one was all system and method, writing everything in a smooth, elegant style. The other belonged to the great inarticulate and wrote the other belonged, sorry, to the great inarticulates and wrote very little beyond commentaries and, quote, occasional notes. Now, here you've got to understand that Schechter loved irony, right? It's one of his great traits. So to call Rashi one of the great inarticulates who, who wrote little beyond commentaries and occasional notes. Yeah, but those were, those were some commentaries that Rashi wrote there, right? Both to Gemara and to, uh, to Tanakh. But now, having said that, with a twinkle in his eye, perhaps tongue-in-cheek, and to some extent not, though, the serious part is the great diversity that exists inside our tradition and how we are better for that diversity. Now we're going to look at what they have in common, which he above called God and Torah. And I want to spend some time on this. And um, whenever I teach this, we go through this statement with great care. 
I don't believe this was a casual statement of Solomon Schechter. This is as good a statement as we have of what unites the various kinds of Jews that he wants to include under w this one category of the kind of Judaism he wants to foster. They both observed the same fasts and feasts. All right? So it's the fasts and feasts that, as it were, provide the space where we meet, the framework inside which we can do all the rest. They both revered the same sacred symbols, though they put different interpretations on them. All right. If you don't have the same sacred symbols, you can't agree to disagree about their interpretations. So in the first instance, it's the fasts and the feasts and the sacred symbols that are our meeting ground. That's where we start. That's not where we end, but that's where we start. They both prayed in the same language, Hebrew. Notice he doesn't say they both used exactly the same siddur. But they both prayed in the same language, Hebrew. So Schechter takes a stand here exactly where Zechariah Frankel did when he walked out of the Reform Rabbinical Conference in the 1840s and founded the movement that became conservative Judaism. Hebrew. They both were devoted students of the same Torah, though they often differed in its explanation. I assume that Schechter means both written Torah and oral Torah. They stu were students of the same Torah. This, for Schechter, is the heart of the matter, and it comes at the heart of his enumeration. They both looked back to Israel's past with admiration and reverence, though Maimonides' conception of the revelation, for instance, largely varied from that of Rashi. So they placed themselves in history. They feel responsible to that history. They feel obligated to that history. Part of that history includes revelation, but they disagreed in their account of what that revelation was. As their ultimate hopes, now we go to the future, centered in the same redemption, in one word, as they studied the Torah and lived in accordance with its laws, and both made the hopes of the Jewish nation their own. All right, let's go over that again. They studied the Torah and lived in accordance with its laws, and they both made the hopes of the Jewish nation their own. And as that was the case, the bonds of unity were strong enough even to survive the misunderstandings between their respective followers. I love that. Right? So it's like, if we could have put Maimonides and Rashi in the same room, they would have known how to talk to each other. They would have understood that they both subscribed to this list. But you know, our followers are not always as wise as their masters. And so it's like, okay, the same way those followers of other people than the Rambam were zealous in trying to get rid of the Rambam's writings or burn them and kick them out of the canon. And the followers of Rashi were among them, perhaps. And the followers of Rambam may not have liked Rashi's followers very much. But you know, if the masters themselves could have gotten together in a room with Solomon Schechter, they could have had an agreement to disagree because they would have realized that when it comes to this list that Solomon Schechter enumerated, they're all on board. That, to me, is really crucial. They're all on board with that. There is a range, but it's not an infinite range, and I would advise us to pay careful attention to the, attention to the things that Solomon Schechter enumerated when we try to talk about what unites us as conservative Jews or as parts of this larger entity that I like to call the vital religious center. Schechter might have called it Catholic Israel, we'll see. Um, that goes a little bit to the right and to the left of conservative Judaism. I want to pass on now to an essay that is likewise extremely important to me and to JTS. It was perhaps the most controversial thing that Schechter ever wrote. Controversial because the subject was Zionism. In 1906, Schechter came out with a statement um, on Zionism, which was an endorsement of Zionism, and I believe it's fair to say I, don't, haven't, I can't say this with certitude because I haven't done historical work. I'm not sure anyone has. But I have pretty good grounds to say that Schechter did not enjoy the support of his board of trustees when he issued this statement. There were some rather famous anti-Zionists on that board. And Schechter felt compelled in 1906, rather early in the game, long before the Balfour Declaration, not long after Herzl burst on the scene, a decade after, a decade after the Judenstadt, by Herzl. 
to issue the statement in 1906 in which he endorses Zionism. And let me just go through several of the major points um, in that endorsement so we can see what Schechter was saying. Had he not said this, something crucial would have been missing from this temple, from JTS, from conservative Judaism. Because Schechter said this, this place and the movement that was centered in this place were pro-Zionist then and there when the official stance of the reform movement was anti-Zionist, down to the late 30s, the Columbus Platform, and there were many Orthodox Jews who rejected Zionism because it seemed to them uh, untowardly messianic. Here's Schechter. <coughs> On one point all Zionists agree, and he does too, namely, that it is not only desirable but absolutely necessary that Palestine, the land of our fathers, should be recovered with the purpose, and listen to this, this goes beyond the Chada'am if I'm correct, with the purpose of forming a home for at least a portion of the Jews who would lead there an independent national life. Now he doesn't use the word state. This is pre-Balfour declaration by a decade. But he wants them to lead there not just an independent cultural life. I don't think he's saying national only in the sense of cultural, who would lead there an independent national life. Perhaps I'm overreading this in light of subsequent events, but this is a quite a statement. And then when you ask Schechter, well, why do you think this is necessary? The answer to him is quite straightforward. He spends several pages numbering this because the Jewish people is in serious danger of losing its identity as a people. This is, I would say, a combination of a Chada'am and a mainstream religious Zionism. What I understand by assimilation is loss of identity or that process of disintegration which, passing through various degrees of defiance of all Jewish thought and disloyalty to Israel's history and its mission, terminates variously in different lands. And then he goes on and talks about the process of, of assimilation and where it is led. And then he makes this term even more forceful. He says, I'm talking about Galut. And he uses the word Galut, which is the mainstay of the Zionist lexicon. And he says here that it's used loosely, expressing, as I have often heard it, the despair and helplessness felt in the presence of a great tragedy. And the tragedy is not imaginary. It is real and it exists everywhere. It is a tragedy to see a great ancient people, da da da, da distinguished by its past, disintegrating before our very eyes. And Schechter comes to America, I believe, because he senses the importance that this place is going to have. We already have millions of Jews here that a decade or two earlier were living in Eastern Europe. We see a prospect of more coming, and Schechter sees before his eyes happening in New York City and elsewhere the reality that a lot of these Jews are losing their Jewishness in the United States, and he sees this as a prospect for Jewish, the Jewish people generally, and he wants to stop it. And you have this gorgeous paragraph not just about the galut of the Jews, but what he then calls the galut of Judaism. Or, as certain mystics express it, expressed it, the galut of hanefesh, the galut of the Jewish soul, wasting away before our very eyes. Schechter founds this place. He devotes his life to it. And at this point, of course, he doesn't know this, but sadly, we know that Schechter had less than a decade left to live. He gave his life to building this institution, as Herzl gave his life to building the Zionist movement. Schechter did this. He came here. He sacrificed the scholarly precincts of, of Cambridge University for JTS because he saw the need to build a new institution, a new kind of Jewish leader, a new kind of Judaism to rescue American Jews from assimilation, from Galut. And that's the same message that, he, that brings him to Zionism. He sees Zionism as the natural ally of what JTS is trying to do. And he says the following statement, which, I, which I'm really fond of also. The reproach, which, go back and look at the Zionists of those years or since, and we find this all over the place. The reproach that Zionism is unspiritual 
Could anything be more contemporary in Schechter's writing from 1906 than the reproach, which I hear from many young Jews today, that Zionism is unspiritual? He says, this is meaningless. Indeed, there seems to be a notion abroad that spirituality is a negative quality. That is, that it has to do with not being X, Y, and Z. Take away the material. Take away the political. Take away the social structure. And that's what you have with spiritual. And that's not what Schechter wanted. Schechter was a real-world guy. Schechter saw JTS in the real world. He saw the Zionists in the real world. And he says at the top of page 99, the Zionists are no saints, but they may fairly claim that few movements are more free from the considerations of convenience and comfort and less tainted with worldliness and other worldliness than the one which they serve. Less tainted with worldliness and other worldliness. They're not going there to make their personal fortune and they're not going there to get their share in the world to come. They're going there to save the Jewish people. And this is something that Schechter really much admired in the Zionists and, and lauded um, all over the place. It's really a really strong essay, strong in 1906 and strong now. Well, I wanted to finish my uh, presentation here with one of the more troubling statements that Schechter made. It's a famous passage. It does not appear in the seminary addresses because it's the end of the preface to the first edition of Schechter's Historical Studies in Judaism. And Mordechai Waxman includes it in his volume, Tradition and Change, sort of the history of conservative Judaism down to the 1950s. And in this essay, titled Historical Judaism, Schechter expresses a worry, uh, a doubt, a problem. And I take this not as his final word on the subject. I don't have Schechter's statements to vouch for this, but it's my interpretation that the worry, the anxiety that Schechter expresses in this essay is one of the reasons he came to JTS. In other words, he sees JTS as the process to ensure that what he worries about in this essay does not come to pass. And this is the essay where Schechter worries that history cannot take the place of faith. He says at the bottom of, uh, it's in, in the Waxman book, this happens in page 93, the historical school of Judaism, the school that became known as conservative Judaism, this is the school that Frankel established, has never, to my knowledge, offered to the world a theological program of its own. By the nature of its task, its labors are mostly conducted in the field of philology and archaeology, and it pays but little attention to pure dogmatic questions. On the whole, its attitude toward religion may be defined as an enlightened skepticism combined with a staunch conservatism, notice the word, a staunch conservatism, which is not even wholly devoid of a certain mystical touch. A staunch conservatism, which is not even wholly devoid of a certain mystical touch. And that's as close as it gets to what he would call a theological program or a statement of faith. What do we stand for? What are we believing? And Schechter is owning up to the fact that you can't turn to the historical school to find that. And I would say one can't turn to Solomon Schechter himself to find that. Schechter gave us some hints. Schechter gave us some direction. Theology, you're not going to find, overtly at least, in Solomon Schechter. And he expresses the doubt that this is going to be enough. The foregoing remarks may be suffice to show that Judaism did not remain quite inactive at the approach of the great religious crisis which our generation has witnessed, so we're not inactive. But the question is whether history itself is going to be enough, is going to be enough to answer that religious crisis or if something more is needed. And then the essay ends with a remarkable confession. How long the position of this school will prove tenable is another question. 
being brought up in the old low synagogue, capital L, capital S, which, sorry, where, with all attachment to tradition, the Bible was looked upon as the crown and climax of Judaism, the old Adam still asserts itself in me, and in unguarded moments makes me rebel, makes me rebel against this new rival of revelation in the shape of history. At times, this now fashionable exaltation of tradition at the expense of scripture even impresses me as a sort of religious bimetallism in which bold speculators in theology try to keep up the market value of an inferior currency by denouncing loudly the bright shining gold which they would have us believe is less fitted to circulate in the vulgar use of daily life than the small cash of historical interpretation. All right, now that's lost on a contemporary audience, but remember your William Jennings Bryan, bimetallism. This is a time when America should cleave to the gold standard or should have silver as well. And to Schechter, the gold standard remains scripture and our attachment to scripture and tradition, which includes both rabbinic tradition and the stuff that's reinterpreting that tradition now, that, he's afraid, is going to drive out the gold standard. And he, being brought up in the low synagogue, again, another metaphor of the time, not high church, the Anglican church, but the low church, the Baptists, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, those who've got the faith, really. That's where he comes from. That's what he wants. And he worries that that may not be enough. However, it would be unfair to argue any further against the theological system, which, as already said, was never avowed directly by the historical school, a school, moreover, with which speculation is a matter of minor importance. The main strength of this school lies in its scientific work, for which Judaism will always be under a sense of deep gratitude. And living as we do, in an age in which history reigns supreme in all departments of human thought, we may hope that even its theology, as far as it goes, will do for us. One may hope that even the theology that the historical school has voiced so far will do for us, though I neither hope nor believe that it will do for those who come after us. He doesn't believe it's going to work for those who come after him, and he doesn't hope that it will work for those who come after him, meaning he wants those who come after him, us, us, not to be content with scholarship, not to be content with history, but, and not to be content with tradition, but to infuse this with new meaning, with new faith. And that, to me, is the final legacy that Solomon Schechter gives to all of us, even though he wrote it in one of the first essays that we have from Solomon Schechter, long before he became Chancellor of JTS. This legacy, Solomon Schechter does not want us to sit on his laurels. That's the last thing in the world he wants. He wants out there creating new forces in Jewish life and in Jewish faith. That, to me, is the ultimate legacy. Thank you, Chancellor Eisen. Um, now we have an opportunity to get questions from you out there. So if you have a comment or question you'd like Chancellor Eisen to address, please uh, add it to the chat box to the right of the screen or on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, bef you know, before we jump into those comments, you'll be happy to know that the seminary addresses is online and available. Uh, thank you, Daniel Graber, for letting us know about that. It's online. It's online for free, apparently. So there's a link. <laughs> there's a link to it uh, next to the the chat box. Thanks again, uh, Daniel Graber, for that. Uh, I first, I would like to ask you a question. So you, you know, you 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 said that that you know, according to Schechter, that Judaism is not about uh, the, the academy or, or tradition or history, only, only. Only, only about that. But as, a, as an institution and, and a movement that is dedicated to the academy, to history and tradition, how do we then take that foundation and move to that, that recreation that, you, were, that you, you and, and he were alluding to? Yeah, I think it's a case where Schechter knew there had to be a solid ground on which to build. And that ground had to be unquestioned, in other words, for solid. In other words, we had to base anything we did on learning. Learning is the key. And especially if you're going to depart from what you find in your status quo, and he wanted to depart from what he found, and that's why he came to this place, to create something different. You have to be basing yourself on a solid foundation of learning. So Schechter went all the way on this. That is, he assembled the finest library in the world that he could, 
right, and gave us what was at the time the finest Judaic library in existence, now the second finest library, second only to the National Library of the State of Israel. And he assembled the finest Judaica faculty he could. And on the basis of that learning, he wanted to build something that was greater than the learning itself. Um, did JTS always do that? Not as well as we could have. Because it turns out, as hard as the learning is, that's the easier piece. The harder part is to figure out what you have to do on the basis of, of that learning. And as Schechter said, the historical school was not always as good on that part of the job as uh, as it might have been, and he hopes at the end there of that, of that essay that, that we'll do better. And, and so I take it that the idea is you're supposed to look at what Judaism has been, how it has changed, what kinds of changes have been successful, what kinds of changes have led to dead ends, and on the basis of that you learn what to change and how to change so that when you are confronted with an issue like shall women be admitted to the rabbinate or the cantorate, you know what the process of that change should be, and you have what to base yourself on. That's, I think, what Schechter very much had in mind. Um, we can debate, and in my class on conservative Judaism, did, we do debate whether Kaplan had Schechter right. That is, um, I'll, 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 if you have other comments, if you do, I'll, I'll, I'll pause here and say just briefly that, as my students know, Schechter is conspicuously absent from Judaism as a civilization. Kaplan should have, by rights, taken on Schechter as he took on everybody else. And he doesn't. And I think the reason was that Schechter was his teacher. And Schechter had been his guardian at JTS, put him in charge of the Teachers Institute. But Kaplan also thought, if I'm right, that if Solomon Schechter had been more straightforward, he would have said this book. That is, Kaplan really believed he was representing Schechter. And so the question I always ask my students was, is that the case? I myself think not. I think Kaplan is a much more radicalized version of Schechter. I don't think Schechter gave Kaplan license to do all that he did. But there is no doubt in my mind that Schechter was not happy with the expressions of religious uh, ob observance and belief that he found on the ground and he wanted some changes. We have questions? Yeah, you actually have a, a question from Daniel Graber. He yes, asks, I did. <laughs> he asks, how do you think Schechter's views on Zionism have shaped the way Israel is considered by JTS, both historically and contemporarily? I think that how Schechter was perceived was as an achad amist. And what I mean by that, and Dan will understand this, but not everyone at the Lunch and Learn will, Achad Am is the progenitor of what we call a spiritual or cultural Zionism. He wanted to establish a Merkaz Ruchani uh, in Zion, a place where Hebrew language would be revived, Jewish culture would be revived by a small nucleus of Jews living on the land in the Hebrew language, and that Hebrew culture would be exported to Jews throughout the world. And this would assist in the project of revitalizing and saving Judaism that Achad Am was serving. So let me say explicitly, Achad Am, unlike Schechter, believed that religion was a thing of the past. Achad Am believed that enlightenment was going to do away with religion. There would be retrograde people, but as a historical phenomenon, Judaism as a religion had to be saved in the form of culture. And Schechter obviously did not believe that. Schechter believed that Jewish culture was necessary but he wanted JTS to be another sort of Merkaz Ruchani, serving the spirit, the religious spirit, as well as a, a spirit in the form of culture. Zionism, political Zionism, was always a controversial subject in the United States, down to World War II, the Holocaust. And JTS did not explicitly endorse political Zionism, although there were individual faculty members of JTS, who, with Schechter's blessing, and that of Cyrus Adler after him, and then Finkelstein, were very supportive of political Zionism. But Finkelstein, we know, was an Achad Amist much more than he was a political Zionist. It didn't take him long after statehood to embrace the state. But I think, I think in answer to Dan's question, JTS was a fervently Zionist place in the terms that Schechter laid out, namely, we are saving the Jewish people from assimilation, we are saving Jewish culture, we need a national home in Palestine. But JTS did not take sides on the various battles to try to define Zionism. And this was not a hotbed of political 
Zionists. And we all know the famous stories of 1948 when Finkelstein did not want the new Israeli flag displayed on the walls of JTS and did not want Hatikva played at JTS commencement. So our students and faculty arranged with the Union Theological Seminary bell tower across the street to play Hatikva at the appropriate point. So we were serenaded with Hatikva, courtesy of the Union Theological Seminary. It's a cute story. It's, it's emblematic of Finkelstein's em embrace of cultural Zionism. And he got with the program very quickly after statehood and then established a JTS presence in Jerusalem in the form of the, the Shokan Library and then the Beit Midrash, which became the Schechter Institute, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one last question for you that I want to go I want to go back to the comparison between the relationship the hypothetical relationship between Rashi and and Maimonides uh, I understand how if if communities were made up of people like Rashi and Maimonides how they could function as a, as a cohesive whole but uh, but I feel like that that's not always the the case so out in the world where not everyone is a Rashi or Maimonides how how does that idea of, it, of disparate approaches to Judaism function so now you're asking an Eisen question, not a Schechter question. I mean, I'll claim Schechter's authority for this on the basis of the essay, but he never laid this out. So it's, it's, it's my observation that a lot of conservative Jews don't know a whole lot about conservative Judaism. It's also my observation that conservative Jews don't know a lot about Orthodox Judaism or Reform Judaism, and everything I just said about conservative Judaism is true of all the other movements as well. So number one, we don't find it necessary to instruct either our lay people or our professionals deeply enough in what the movement stands for or what other movements stand for. That's, that's the first thing. And number two, we don't instruct our lay people enough in what their tradition has stood for historically. So when I say the words Rashi, there's a resonance there because I had the good fortune of going, starting as an eight-year-old, I mean, starting as an eight-year-old with, with Chumash and Rashi, and then all through high school, in a Hebrew high school program, doing, doing serious Rashi in Rashi script, and, and first encountering Tosafot, and, and Rashi's commentary on the Gemara, et cetera, et cetera. And so Rashi is a living presence for me. And then it was somewhat later that Maimonides became a living presence for me because I worked through him, and I don't know a whole lot of Jewish intellectuals in our day who have not had Maimonides as a kind of a, a guidepost and a hero. But how many Jews in our pews of any denomination have worked through Rashi and Rambam? So, in a sense, there, there's a kind of, of ignorance out there which we've tolerated, and it's really unfortunate. And if, I think the way to overcome the disparagement of, of, of the other by, by each movement, maybe I'm naive, but I think that actually if we knew each other better, there'd be less disparagement rather than more. I think if there were more appreciation of who we are, I'll never forget the the experience I had with a Haredi Jew in Israel, I'm talking to him in Hebrew, I was glad that he agreed to speak Hebrew to me because I don't have Yiddish. And he had no notion. I said to him, you don't know who I am, you have no idea what, I do, what a conservative Jew is. So why are, you, why are you cursing conservative Judaism? You've never met one. You've never talked to one. And I fear that that's the kind of disparagement, and we know from, from Steve Cohen's surveys, it goes both ways. The disparagement of Orthodox Judaism and Jews among non-Orthodox Jews in the United States is of dramatic and horrifying proportions. And so we, we have a job to do, all of us, in overcoming the gaps uh, that divide us. And Schechter's case for Rashi and Rambam is a really good place to start. Well, Our questioners are being shy. Yeah, they, they are being a little bit shy. Want to turn to the people in the room? Uh, sure. We are, we're, we're, we are blessed with a live studio audience of two rabbinical students. And so, do you guys have any questions? My question was actually akin to what Charlie just asked. <coughs> um, you had said before that, <coughs> excuse me, in relation to Rashi and Rambam, that it's the masters can sort of get along, but their students can't. And you answered this a little bit, but I, I want to ask you again, like, what role do you think that the teachers of the movements have in trying to encourage all of the members to come together and have these connections that you're talking about will end sort of strife and disparagement? So just, just to, to repeat, the question is, what, does the, what role do teachers have and the teachers of the movement have to, to bring together uh, these disparate 
the disparate populations and disparate groups of Jews and to bring about mutual understanding. Is that right? See, um, this is Ethan Witkowski, our one of our fourth year rabbinical students and one of the students in my class on conservative Judaism who asked this question. And Ethan, Schechter didn't have a concept of pluralism, and we do. And one of the things that is not widely understood, I would say is very widely misunderstood, is that pluralism is not the same as relativism. So relativism means that anything goes. Anything is equally good. There's no good with a capital G. There's no bad with a capital B. Everything equally goes. Pluralism, it says, I can have respect for people who disagree with me seriously. But there have to be things on which we ourselves agree. Right? The example I always give is that rabbinic Judaism is somewhat pluralistic regarding the children of Noah. It has great respect for the category of B'nai Noach. It doesn't have a whole lot of respect for Avodah Zarah. That's outside the pale. And so we should certainly have an appreciation for what other Jews do and believe and for the kinds of Judaism that they practice. And I think it, it impoverishes us. It impoverishes me as the chancellor or you as a rabbinical student if you and I don't walk around with empathy for, understanding of, the Jews who disagree with us including Jews who disagree with us so seriously, and Jews, including Jews who disagree with us so seriously they don't respect us. And part of being a conservative Jew, I think, is having respect for even Jews who don't respect us. I appreciate where they're coming from, and I value their contribution to Jewish life, even if they don't appreciate where I'm coming from and don't value my contribution. This is my inheritance. I'm, I'm not, it's, not a, it's not a horrible burden to bear. It's one of the prices we pay. But okay, it's fine. It's fine. Haredi Jews may not value my Judaism. I value their Judaism an enormous amount, even though there are things about it that I seriously disagree with it. But it's my job to understand where they're coming from. And I think it's our job to make sure that you, every rabbinical student who graduates this place, should understand why there are Haredi Jews, modern Orthodox Jews, Reformed Jews, uh, classical Reformed Jews, um, secular Jews, secular humanist Jews, why Israel has taken the shape that it has religiously, etc., etc. That should be part of the basic operating equipment of every JTS rabbi. And I would, if I were preaching to other movements, I would say of their rabbis as well and of our communal leadership. And I think it's possible. I actually do think that greater understanding of why, where we all come from is actually helpful in showing us all what we agree on. Now, if you don't have another question, I'll proceed here. Do you have a question? Uh, there's, there's one more uh, related question. Uh, there's a question from Benji F. asking if, um, if Schechter use, uses Rambam as a model for his vision of conservative mm -hmm. Judaism as a fusion of, of secular and religious faith. Or Rambam. Uh, Rambam or, in other words, Schechter's not saying Rambam <coughs> is my only model of conservative Judaism. Schechter wants a conservative Judaism that will appreciate Rambam as well as Rashi. Now, I think the, the, the person who asked the question, Ben Giaf, is right on some point that he picked up in, in what I read. Schechter admires Rambam. He's not, Rambam is not suspect in his eyes because of Rambam's use of Aristotle. That is praiseworthy in Schechter's eyes, right? So Rambam is a, is a model for conservative Judaism in that Rambam not only wrote the Mishnah Torah, but the guide. Rambam not only knew his Talmud, Rambam knew his Aristotle. That is what Schechter does want conservative Judaism and JTS to be. But Schechter also fervently, it's not too strong a word, fervently admired Rashi. That's what I think is behind that tongue-in-cheek about the little, bit of, the little bit of commentary that Rashi wrote. For goodness sake, I think Schechter admired the brilliance of those commentaries, they're indispensable to us. And if, I, if I'm not mistaken, Schechter wanted to see us adding to those commentaries. And Schechter would have welcomed a Shoal Lieberman. I mean, for goodness sake, Schechter would have welcomed the Talmud faculty that JTS has right now, who are masters of the commentaries and the super commentaries and the super super commentaries, and who can write their own commentaries on those, on those commentaries. So I don't think Schechter purely wants a JTS positioned on the outside, Schechter is, I think, quite open to, respectful of those who position themselves more on the inside, and both of those people are necessary for the mix. Both of those kinds of Jews are necessary, which is why Schechter had a notion of Catholic Israel that was broader than any one particular school. We have a question in the room, if you have time for it. Sure. Okay. Um, regarding the kind of 
seminary that, that Schechter wanted, looking at the trajectory of the seminary over the course of the 20th century, particularly as it moved further uh, away from the Orthodox movement, according at least to the Orthodox movement, and uh, with it, the incorporation of egalitarianism. I mean, how do you think Schechter would view the modern day seminary and also the halakhic process as it has, uh, you, you talk about his link to the rabbis of old, what do you think his opinion of the rabbis of the conservative movement over the, the last hundred years would be? So just, just to, to repeat the question, what do you think Schechter would say about JTS as it is today and also the halakhic process of the conservative movement as it is today? You know, I deeply want Schechter's blessing. I would love it if Schechter said, you know, this guy Arnie, he doesn't know everything that I know, but he's doing an okay job. I, I would love it if Schechter could say that. I'm suspicious because I'm enough of a historian, as he was, of people who try to transpose past historical figures to present circumstances and wonder what they would have said. <coughs> so there were disagreements on the JTS faculty when it came to ordination of women or ordination of gays and lesbians, and I don't know exactly which side Schechter would have come down on. I don't know whether he would have come down on my side of these things or not. I think he would have welcomed the debate, and I think he, I think he would have welcomed the terms of the debate. He would have, would have wanted that debate to be halachic, as it was. Um, but I, I don't know exactly what side Schechter would have come down on, but I, I, I do, do believe completely in my previous comment, my answer to Ethan, that Schechter definitely would have sided with me in insisting that our rabbinical students study other kinds of Judaism and other religious traditions. Just look at what Schechter wrote and his own terms of reference. This was a man of wide-ranging erudition. He read really broadly. He, I think it's fair to say, looked down on people who did not read broadly. Schechter wanted his faculty to read broadly. Look at who he chose. Look at the kind of work they did under his watch. So this was a kind of faculty that was broad and not narrow, and a kind of student body that was broad and not narrow. And you know, you can imagine Hertz, of the famous Hertz Chumash, sitting here as a student, getting ordained to JTS alongside Mordechai Kaplan. I mean, there, there, was, a, there was a wide range uh, of student body and faculty here, um, and I think that Schechter okay. applauded that. So I can see Schechter reveling in our disagreements. I don't know where he would have come out at the end of those disagreements. It's always good to end on a, on a question, right, <laughs> to continue the conversation. Uh, so you are more than welcome to continue the conversation either in the chat box or on Facebook and, and Twitter. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to thank Chancellor Eisen for a really, you, <laughs> for a really uh, enlightening, enlightening live stream lunch and learn. And of course, this will go up online, both on YouTube and on learn.jtsa.edu, for you to enjoy and to continue commenting on. So thank you very much, and have a great rest of the day.